As I promised yesterday, um, I'm going to be going through the Four Corners segment expose special documentary that they did on the Liberal Party post the election. After a lot of elections, uh, parties, if they've lost especially, they go through this post-mortem. Even the Labour Party go through it despite their wins for seats like Christina Keneally's, where she got smashed. In the Liberal Party, it's a little bit more thorough. They had a faction, which was the Hawke Scott Morrison faction, which had the reins on power during the election, and they exercised a lot of that power, squashing the membership. Now, if you haven't seen this uh, segment, if you may not, if you're not sure if you'll be interested, here's a quick taster for you, so you get a bit of an insight into what this next forty minutes will look like. We're going to watch the documentary together, but here's a quick thirty second promo. The general public is completely turned off by what they see as factional games. I'm speaking out because many people inside the Liberal Party aren't able to speak. Factional warfare exposed. I can't remember another time where there was such confusion about pre-selection. There were people that were working hard to take me out. Inside the Liberal election loss. This cancer needs to be cut out. What do you make of that? I thought I'd say it all. I better not talk about this. I'm sorry. Four Corners, Monday, ABC TV and... So that was aired uh, on Monday, and I watched it once already, and I'm going to watch it again with you guys in a few minutes. I hope you guys sort of find that's a bit of a taster. Here's why it's so important to watch this kind of thing. The Liberal and the Labor Party still have the dominant reins on what legislation is being made. In the lower house, the Labor Party have 76 seats. They'll be able to get whatever legislation passed that they want. And in the upper house, they only need one extra vote in the crossbench either from the Teal Independent, David Pocock, or even Jackie Lambie, who has two seats, or even One Nation, in order to get legislation passed. Similarly, the Liberal Party still have a massive civil war going on right now, and it's not unfamiliar. We've seen that happen in the Conservative Party in America, the Republicans, and we've seen the Never Trumpers, the Rhinos, versus the Donald Trump faction. But we've also seen in the UK this week, Boris Johnson under intense scrutiny in the Conservative Party in the UK. In Australia, we're seeing a similar sort of thing. You've got a Conservative Party that say they're conservative. They say they're for liberal values. They say that they actually stand up for individual freedoms, freedom of speech, bodily autonomy. But that's not what ends up playing out at the end of the day. There are very good people in the Liberal Party that are trying to reform the party, whether they can, whether they can't, we're going, to, we're going to tune in. We're going to see exactly what happened in this particular segment. This was done by the ABC. And if you're like me and you're not a big fan of them, I, I understand if you want to turn it off. This is probably one of the better things that, that they've actually produced. I thought it was really interesting to see them sit down with all the different parties. And, um, I, and we'll have a bit of a chat at the end of it. But tune in. Put it on the background. If you guys don't have 40 minutes to spare now, put it on later. I'll upload it on everywhere, YouTube, Instagram, uh, Facebook, and, uh, and we'll kick it off. Without further ado, let's get started. On the evening of March 29, while all eyes were on Parliament House for the federal budget, a Liberal warrior was preparing to drop a bombshell. It was a critical night for Scott Morrison's government, hoping for a political reset before its re-election campaign in a few weeks' time. This is one of the Freedom this Senators, is a time um, to Conchetta for Avanti Walls. A She's plan great. for a stronger economy and a stronger future we will deliver. Yeah. She voted for Pauline Hanson's um, freedom of choice with the jab Auntie Wells bill. had other plans. She'd recently learned she'd been put in an unwinnable spot on the Liberal ticket for the upcoming election, ending a 17-year political career. I knew that my time in the Senate was coming to an end, and there were certain matters that I wished to put on the record, and this afforded me the opportunity to have my say the leading Conservative hadn't come to praise Prime Minister Scott Morrison, she'd come to bury him. Uh, Senator Ferravanti Wells. In order to understand the man, it is best to look at his past actions. He is adept at running with the foxes and hunting with the hounds, lacking the moral compass and having no conscience. Sour grapes is certainly what was prominent in my mind as I listened to the whole download. I don't think the oh, drop was brutal. Just before an election is the right thing to do. 
Conchetta Ferravanti Wells laid bare her own account of a brutal factional war raging inside the party for years. The constitution was trashed. There is a putrid stench of corruption emanating from the New South Wales division of the Liberal Party. There were people that were working hard to take me out. Our job this is, one of the is to picks. fight for them, not fight each other. She's Ferravanti the deputy Wells leader of the Liberal more Party than now. The Prime Minister in her line of fire. Her other Alex target, Hawk. his close ally and faction boss, Alex Hawke. There is a very appropriate saying here, the fish stinks from the head. Morrison and Hawke have ruined the Liberal Party in New South Wales. I think Alex and the movement that he's built is a cancer that has infected the party and it needs to be excised. This cancer needs to be cut out. I'm speaking out because many, many people inside the Liberal Party aren't able to speak. Tonight on Four Corners, we expose that was the Matthew faction fighting being blamed for fomenting um, the coalition's devastating he's, election. He's wild. Loss, with Liberal Party insiders speaking out for the first time. We investigate extraordinary allegations about backroom party operatives and how they tried to wield their power and reveal how, on the brink of the federal election, the internal warfare was deliberately escalated, driven by a deep-set hatred and a hunger for revenge. If you're tuning in just now, give this a share. There's 200 of you listening live right now, which isn't bad for 4 p.m. on a Thursday. Let's see what this has in store for us. This is Ray Hadley in the morning, right across Australia. God, I hate this guy so much. This guy is bordering on fascistic. In fact, He's the reason why we had so Every much policing in New South Wales. Every weekday morning at 9 o'clock, one of Australia's best-known radio hosts hits the airwaves. And good morning, good welcome. I'm Ray Hadley. Great to have your company on 2GB, 2CC, 4BC, stations on Capital Radio. No matter where you are listening across the... Ray Hadley is a powerful voice in national politics, with particular influence inside the Liberal Party. In a bizarre conversation... Sure does. He asked for more days policing. Days after Conchetta Ferravanti-Wells' speech, he told his audience exactly what he thought of it. On the way out the door, Connie Fioretta-Wells tosses a hand grenade. Well, I think that what Connie said on that budget night would uh, suggest to me, as was the case with many others within the Liberal Party, they were, you know, venting <laughs> about their unhappiness with the party generally, and I thought it was less than helpful heading to a federal election, to have people with inside the party fighting with you. I, I'm sure that Anthony Albanese was sitting back thinking, how good is this? He'll seek greater defence ties... Hadley had been intensely focused on a factional war unfolding in the Liberal Party that threatened to derail its election chances. The Prime Minister's on. Prime Minister, good morning. G'day, Ray. Yeah, yeah. As the election loomed, candidates had still not been chosen in more than a dozen New South Wales seats. We are getting closer to May. When are we going to have some of the definitive answer in New South Wales as to who's going to stand and get rid of this nonsense? Well, it is very frustrating and there's some childish games going on there. But uh, those playing games in the New South Wales and Liberal Party organisations need to ensure they focus on winning this election for the goodness of the Australian people and forget their factional rubbish. I've sat through a lot of federal elections having done this so job for a lot rich of from times, ScoMo. I, I can't remember another time where you know, there was such confusion about pre-selections for either the Labor Party, the Liberal Party or anyone else. It just seemed to me that it was ridiculous. Alexander George Hawke. In the pre-selection crisis, the stakes were high for one of Scott Morrison's political lieutenants, then Immigration Minister Alex Hawke. Scott Morrison and Hawke got into Parliament at the same time, 2007. They were very, very close. They put together a little group of people in that party room that were loyal to them, that weren't part of the left-wing faction, weren't part of the right-wing faction, part of the ScoMo faction. ScoMo was the face, Alex was the numbers man. It was a very, very successful team. It's great to be here in Western Sydney. Hawke and others were facing nope, challenges in the pre-selection from candidates backed by the hard-right faction. To head off the threat, Hawke is accused of not being available for the vetting meetings that would allow the pre-selections to go ahead. He had a crucial mm, role in those meetings as the Prime Minister's representative. That's a key point. There that's was a World very War key III point. Between the factions, in terms of the candidates who had been nominated, it then became a, a standoff, um, which explains 
Alex Hawke's absence from a series of, of meetings where he should have been present. He was the Prime Minister's representative. Uh, he wasn't there, certain things didn't happen, and the whole pre-selection process derailed. One man was determined not to let Alex Hawke get his way, and I'm about to meet him. Matthew Kamenzuli is an avowed conservative and a bitter factional enemy of Alex Hawke. He put his own political future at risk by taking on the Liberal Party. And until now, he's never spoken about it. Sure, Matthew, good day. Well, thanks. How are you? Good. Come in, please. Thank you. Matthew, why are you away. choosing to speak out about this now? I'm speaking out because many, many people inside the Liberal Party aren't able to speak. And I'm not in the Liberal Party anymore. They threw me out. Matthew Kamenzuli was a member of the New South Wales Liberal Party's governing body, the State Executive, and a key player in the hard-right faction. He wanted to take down Alex Hawke and his allies to get his own people into Parliament. I think the reason that Alex didn't go to the, the various meetings was uh, in order to build pressure, in order to build a situation where a deal had to be struck, a transaction had to be done cross-factionally um, in order to, you know, sort of help Alex get the sort of candidates that he wanted in the seats that he wanted. I think he was trying to protect key allies and select further allies because he's gone from stacking uh, shelves to stacking branches and then he attempted to stack parliament. And that's probably the easiest way for Alex to maintain power is by stacking. Give him a bit of encouragement, all good people. Former Liberal Party member John Ruddick is a strong supporter of Matthew Kamenzuli. Democracy is coming. He's since joined the rival Liberal Democrats. So they can't have a meeting without the Prime Minister's representative, OK? And they just, they just, they just wound down the clock. Then we get to it's the eve of the election. They say, oh, well, let's stop these factional games. Let's just appoint them. And that's what happened. I believe it cost them the election. Alex mm. Hawke declined to be interviewed, but in a statement said... The specific allegation made by some that I delayed or had any ability to delay nomination review by not attending is false. As per party oh, requirements, <laughs> I have no role in deciding matters in relation to my own pre-selection. Why, why won't you appear? With our family why won't you appear in this documentary? Just weeks before the federal election was called, <laughs> Scott Morrison used the party rules to head off the challenge by the right by installing his own candidates, including sure Alex did. Hawke, and then Cabinet Minister Susan Lee. Why did See, that's you a conflict the of interest of Scott Morrison and indeed Alex Hawke to protect you? Mm. I don't blame Scott Morrison. I don't blame Alex Hawke. I blame the factional games and the infighting that led to this point and would have seen good Cabinet Ministers, good first-term members of Parliament and good marginal seat members ousted, potentially. And that's the thing that we needed to address and we continue to need to address within the New South Wales division. The fact that the party I don't like Susan at all. To its base Not at all. Matthew Kamenzuli hit back with an extraordinary move. He took his own party to court. There are a number of us. He held up the election for weeks. In the party ...that thought that this process that was being imposed upon the members, which was a federal intervention because Alex wasn't getting his own way, was essentially a bad thing and bad for democracy and bad for you know any future opposition or government. Um, so we asked the courts whether or not they thought what was going on was, was a good idea, essentially. We just went to the court. Your cousin, Charles Kamenzuli, was trying to get pre-selected for Parramatta for the Liberal Party. You say you were doing it for the right reasons, but wasn't there a degree of self-interest there as well? There are much, much easier ways to get the candidates that you want into Parliament. And most specifically, um, we don't know who would have won the selection in Parramatta. We just wanted a pre-selection. So, Matthew, what do we got here? Oh, this is one of the many documents from when we sued the Liberal Party in order to try and get democratic pre-selections across the board. So, as you can see here, I was the first plaintiff and Scott Morrison being the first defendant, among others. So you lost this case. What did you do then? Well, then we went on to the, to the High Court. Um, yeah. And how did the party react to that? Well, they sent me this letter. And this letter is uh, my expulsion letter. They threw me out of the party. And um, they threw me out of the party simply for going to court. They threw me out of the party 
Kamenzuli's court action failed, but damage had been done. The internal divisions were now on public display. If a party gets involved in a litigation about an internal matter, you're in strife. Now, he did what, what was his right to, um, to, to pursue uh, a legal outcome, but it's a pretty poor alternative and paints a picture um, correctly about what a, an appalling state of affairs it, it was in relation to those pre-selections. It wasn't the first time Morrison had to save one of his political allies from conservative challenges. A year earlier, Western Sydney MP Melissa McIntosh was under attack from forces aligned with Matthew Kamenzuli. She'd won the seat of Lindsay from Labor in 2019. While I was working with my community, there were people that were working hard to take me out. And they were working hard to build branches, uh, build their memberships. These were people that I'd never met before in my life, that people that worked That's with the democratic me process. on the 2019 election, local people, had never met before. They were from out of the area. At the right. annual meeting of her branches at a local club, McIntosh says she was ambushed when 20 new people suddenly arrived. Matthew Kamenzuli was also there. I turned up to a local Liberal Party meeting and they aggressively took over that meeting, every single executive spot that belonged to local people. They shouted over the then Minister for Women, Maurice Payne. They shouted over me. They shouted over anyone that disputed their claim for positions. These are people that we never met before in our lives. A bunch of blokes who were working specifically to take me out. Four Corners has obtained an email that McIntosh later sent to the party leadership, in which she says, Matthew Kamenzuli appeared to be orchestrating much of the events that took place, and even yelling from the back of the room. He denies this. Shortly afterwards, Melissa McIntosh went to a meeting of Liberal MPs in Canberra, where she was confronted by a key ally of Matthew Kamenzuli. Senator Connie Ferraventi Wells pulled me out of that meeting and told me it was in my best interest to go along with the people that were uh, doing this to me uh, within my branches. Um, I'm really disappointed. I think it's really unacceptable behaviour. She feels it was inappropriate for you to be supporting the people she claims were trying to ambush her and challenge her pre-selection. What do you say to that? I understood that there was some tension between Melissa and other members of her conference. And I wanted to assist because I knew the people. And so for that reason, I offered my assistance to Melissa to see if I could uh, introduce them and to ensure that they could work together towards the common objective of Melissa winning the next federal election. Melissa McIntosh demanded that the party investigate what went on. She was shocked at the response. I addressed that executive and I felt like I was treated in a disrespectful way and it was unacceptable behaviour. At this particular state executive meeting, one of the people who are on state executive uh, stood up and acted in an intimidating way in front of me, walked, paced in front of me. He was intimidating so much that someone uh, at the back of the room, another state executive member, stood up and asked for him to sit down and stop behaving in that way. I made this request 14 months ago to state executive. I have not heard back from state executive once about my request for them to investigate my local uh, branch meeting on that occasion and the behaviour that took place. And why do you think that is? That state executive is made up of factional warlords who have nothing better to do than to act in a thuggish way uh, towards members of parliament like myself first term, marginal seat MPs like myself who just were wanting to work hard for their community. That's what being a member of parliament's about. It was a really tough time. 
Scott Morrison eventually convinced the right to drop the challenge. At this year's election, Melissa McIntosh was returned in Lindsay with a swing towards her. We need to change our culture. We can have all the quotas in the world, but it will be a revolving door of women if we don't address the culture within the Liberal Party to make it a more supportive culture uh, where uh, complaints or issues or concerns are taken seriously. It is unacceptable that the Liberal Party is allowing this type of behaviour to happen. I don't think it's acceptable. And I can't encourage other women, professional women, to leave their careers, uh, to spend time away from their families uh, to pursue a career uh, where there is this type of thuggish behaviour happening uh, within the Liberal Party. It's really just politics. Uh, politics is a bit, pretty much like that. Also, her accusations on that meeting, I've heard a different version of events, but it's hard because you, you don't see Matt Camenzulli's response to that on the segment. In the Liberal Party, there are three major factions. The left or moderate faction, led by Simon Birmingham. The hard right or conservative faction led by Peter Dutton. Conchetta Ferravanti Wells and Matthew Kamenzuli are aligned to this group. And the centre right, run by Alex Hawke and led nationally by Scott Morrison when he was Prime Minister. Susan Lee is closest to this group. Mm. The factions are very powerful. That's not something that's happened overnight. It, it has evolved certainly in the, in the 40 years that I've been involved in, in the Liberal Party, um, and to the point that the, the factions in the Liberal Party today are not dissimilar in terms of the power that they, that they wield um, compared with the Labor Party. And why is that problematic? It's problematic because you end up with the, the spectre of a party within a party, that for a lot of people becomes the reason they belong to the party. In other words, not to compete in the marketplace of ideas, not to compete against other parties and candidates or sitting members in the context of, a, of an election, but really to make sure that your faction um, has the numbers, is on the ascendancy and basically has its way. They are mafia without the violence. Now, they will um, break rules, party rules, OK? It's a question about whether they break other rules, OK? But they are, they are gangs fighting over turf. Now, the mafia fights over turf to control streets and control, you know, stand over businesses, etc. The turf war of these mafia gangs, these mafia light gangs, is who's going to be in Parliament. The origins of the factional brawl over pre-selections began years earlier. In 2015, Malcolm Turnbull, backed by the moderates... Quite a crowd today. ..removed the hard-right leader Tony Abbott as Prime Minister. <laughs> Two years later, the Conservatives took revenge. A wounded Tony Abbott led the charge to give each branch member more power in candidate selection a process known as a plebiscite. Every member of our party has Abbott's motion succeeded, weakening the moderate faction bosses that had removed him from power. Look, this has been a very important convention. It's been a very significant outcome. It's a clear road ahead uh, to one member, one vote pre-selections, a clear road ahead to a democratic political party which is controlled by its members, uh, not by lobbyists, not by factionalists, not by string pullers, but by ordinary, decent Australians. Thanks, Thanks so much. much. It took several years for the rules to be implemented. They were in full force in time for this year's federal election, <laughs> sparking the pre-selection crisis. Well, I think the word is debacle. There is nothing more important in the day-to-day -day life of a political organisation than pre-selections. It's core business. It was two minutes to midnight in the lead-up to the federal election before those pre-selections took place. And when they took place, they were really a forced captain's call that involved the Prime Minister 
Why is protecting you and your colleagues in that situation more important than giving local branch members a democratic say in who their candidate is? Well, plebiscites are a good thing, but they need to be managed. They need to be managed in a way that produces an outcome that's good for our party and good for the nation. Because remember, at the end of all this, I've got constituents over 100,000 that are voting for the person they want to see take their messages to Canberra and fight for them. And when they look at us fighting amongst ourselves, they turn away. Hey guys, got some good news. I've got John Ruddick. He's going to jump on after we yeah, uh, like conclude Tom this. Electorate, which has the highest proportion of families. With the Despite being virtually unknown to the public, Alex Hawke strategically built his power behind the scenes, not only inside the federal Liberals, but in New South Wales as well. His first political home was the hard right faction. In the early 2000s, Hawke seized the presidency of the New South Wales Young Liberals from the moderates. It was pretty extraordinary. And only about two years after that, the state executive also fell to the right. Thanks to Alex, the energy that he brought. Um, so that was impressive. Hawke was named as a central player in the downfall of moderate New South Wales Liberal leader John Brogdon who resigned after reports that he made a racist remark at a function. Hawke was accused of spreading the story. A federal president of the Young, of the young Liberal Movement, Alex Hawke, has been named as pushing it. Uh, and why um, were they doing He needs doing to take that? a long, hard look at himself. Well, look, it's pretty obvious that, uh, that uh, everybody in politics, everybody in politics has people out to get them. Hawke issued a statement at the time saying the allegation was false. Four or five years later, Alex and a small number of others break away from the right, badge themselves as the centre right, but go into business with the left and bring the left back into power. That created an enormous amount of animosity, created this new situation where there was three factions. The breakaway faction infuriated the hard right. When I first met Hawke, he was ostensibly a part of the conservative movement. And I thought that he stood up for a set of values and beliefs. However, over the years, it has become clear that for Alex, politics has become uh, more of a very much um, factional winner-take-all attitude. And I think that once you cross that line where politics is no longer about values and beliefs and simply becomes about visceral ends, uh, it's no longer staying true, I think, to yourself uh, as a good parliamentarian and as a good politician. Alex has been a political staffer, a political operative, a factional hack for many, many years. Alex uh, was somebody who's caused much division inside of the Liberal Party. <laughs> Since his election to Parliament in 2007, Alex Hawke has further consolidated his power through a fundraising body called the Mitchell Club, run by local mm. party officials. Mm. Four corners Below the money, guys. That donors to the Mitchell Club have been invited to pay up to $12,000 a year in return for access to government ministers, including the Prime wow. Minister. See how they get around funding laws? Just below the level where the money needs to be publicly disclosed. Mm. Fundraising organisations that hang off political parties basically uh, invite people who are interested in politics, within the corp mainly within the corporate world, um, to attend lunches or dinners or, or other, other functions. That provides access it also provides influence, or at least the opportunity for influence. The truth is that most politicians get their hands dirty with fundraising. Alex Hawke's seat of Mitchell covers the increasingly wealthy suburbs of northwest Sydney, an area known to locals like broadcaster Ray Hadley as the Hills. I've been a resident in the Hills for 30 years a ratepayer in the hills, and I've taken a keen interest in various things that have happened out there. 
The hills is a very conservative area, a mix of population, a large uh, population of people have come from uh, different parts of the world. The development uh, in the hills is white hot. It's an event here in the hills that led to one of the most damning allegations against Alex Hawke by Conchetta Faravanti Wells in her speech to the Senate. Welcome everyone. She dredged up a three and a half year old dispute about a Liberal Party branch meeting held at this funeral home in Borkham Hills. All in favour? On the agenda was the admission of new members, which could have threatened Hawke's power in the area. Hawke was present at the meeting. He saw what went on. After the meeting, the minutes were falsified to show that the 10 members were not accepted. Despite clear evidence of fraud, Hawke's role in this process has never been fully disclosed. One of the rejected members complained to the police that fraud may have occurred. New South Wales Police told Four Corners that, based on what has been received, police do not see any evidence of a criminal offence. Alex Hawke said the Liberal Party has stated that no MP has been investigated over the dispute. Yeah, guys, um, John Ruddick and maybe Matthew Cummins will be calling in at Six the end of this, so stay tuned, give this election, a share, the get it out there. escalated to a whole new level, with extraordinary claims and counterclaims, many of which are impossible to prove. The players, many motivated by power and revenge, present different versions of events. We've obtained this dossier sent late last year to the New South Wales Corruption Watchdog by a senior member of Alex Hawke's faction. One of its most stunning allegations is that Liberal figures offered to carry out a branch stacking operation to overthrow a local council to benefit an infamous property developer, John Nassif. John Nassif owns the property development firm Top Place. I love you, man. He rocketed to prominence after this social media post of him presenting his wife with a luxury car went viral. Congratulations, Mrs Nassif. Do you like? But it's his <laughs> buildings that have drawn the most attention. Some have been widely criticised for their defects. Around 2014, Nassif embarked on one of his most ambitious projects. He started buying up land worth more than $200 million around the new Cherrybrook metro station to build thousands of new apartments. In my view, it was just an... an Alan Hazelden was Liberal Deputy Mayor of the Hillshire Council when he met John Nassif to discuss the proposal. The Mayor and I um, attended the meeting. Um, Mr Nassif and um, his chief executive, or one of his senior executives, whose name I don't recall, attended, showed us um, some proposed layouts. And I guess at that point, the magnitude of the proposal became apparent. And I hadn't really, personally as a, as a ward councillor, I hadn't even really considered that scale of development around the Cherrybrook station. Top Place was struggling to convince the council to support the project. So I guess I want to know One claim in the Hawk faction dossier sent to the New South Wales corruption watchdog ICAC is that Nassif met two right faction Liberal Party identities to discuss his frustrations. Christian Ellis and Charles Perrottet, the brother of future Premier Dominic Perrottet. The dossier alleges that at this meeting, Charles Perrottet put forward a remarkable proposal, that before the next council election, he and others could stack branches to influence the pre-selection of Liberal candidates favourable to Nassif's development, if Nassif could fund the operation. Four mm. Corners has been unable to establish that this offer was made to John Nassif. Last year, before the Hillshire council election, the New South Wales Liberal State Executive chose a new group of candidates. Alan Hazelden was dumped. I received an email from the State President. I think I've said thank you for your contribution. This is the list of endorsed candidates for the various wards. And of course, my name uh, wasn't <laughs> on them, and nor were the, the, the names of, of most of my um, former colleagues, including the Mayor. And what, what did that make you think? Well, I was stunned. The new Hills Shire Council was elected late last year. It hasn't reconsidered the top place proposal. Just two weeks ago, an Alex Hawke ally, 
New South Wales State MP Ray Williams weaponised this allegation against the hard right faction by making it public under parliamentary privilege. Apparently, prior to the council elections, Jean Nassif of Top Place met with Christian Ellis and other senior members of the Liberal Party who were paid significant funds in order to arrange to put new councillors on the Hillshire Council who would be supportive of future Top Place development applications. Top Place Top to bottom, guys, no it's smashed. Ray Williams' allegations. New South Wales Premier Dominic Perrottet referred them to ICAC. But Four Corners can reveal that in March, ICAC declined to investigate these allegations when they were raised in the Hawk faction dossier. Despite mm. the alleged political manoeuvring within the New South Wales Liberal Party affecting how the elected council is constituted, allegations that new councillors may be more supportive of developers are not sufficient to warrant investigation by the Commission. Four Corners has established that a meeting between Christian Ellis, Charles Perrottet and John Nassif did take place at Top Place's office. But what was discussed is hotly disputed. Sources familiar with the meeting deny an offer to change the council was discussed and insist John Nassif complained about his projects being treated unfairly because he had refused to donate to the Mitchell Club the Liberal fundraising body mm. run from Alex Hawke's electorate. Alex Hawke denies this. All donations are managed through the Federal Liberal Party. I have not exercised any influence for or against any development, nor sought to through anyone else. Any claim in this regard is farcical, false and defamatory. Mm. The Hawke faction dossier sent to ICAC contains more allegations that inflame the factional war. That Alex Hawke was the target of an elaborate branch stacking plot by the hard right. It details a meeting in 2018, again involving the hard right liberal identity Christian Ellis, and says that with him was John Claude Perrottet, another of New South Wales Premier Dominic Perrottet's brothers. Christian Ellis and Jean-Claude Perrottet are said to have approached a Northern Sydney businessman and Liberal Party member, Fritz Mare, and asked him for $50,000 to bankroll branch stacking in the Hills District. Four Corners has obtained a text message sent to Fritz Mare by an associate who tells Mare that he still can't believe that approach to you by Christian Ellis and JC Perrottet, and that 50k would stack more than Hawke's seat. There's no evidence that any money was paid. And Fritz Mare told Four Corners he couldn't comment on someone else's alleged text message, which he described as unverified and one-sided. We asked former Liberal John Ruddick <laughs> for his assessment of the allegation. I just want to give you a look at this chat with a John. text message exchange we've got a hold of. OK, well... Um, what, what do you make of that? Um, look, I thought I'd seen it all. Um, you know what? Um, I better not talk about this. I'm sorry. In response to the <laughs> claims it, in John? the dossier... Maybe I'll ask Mike him. Said it. <laughs> ...has considered the allegations raised. The Commission will not be investigating the allegations. Stay tuned, guys. In about uh, five minutes, we'll be having John Ruddick the country is and like maybe Matthew Cammonsoli on by phone. The Liberals had a catastrophic election result in New South Wales, losing six seats, in part thanks to the factional brawl. Of the 12 seats where Morrison installed his captain's picks, only three were won by the Liberals. And I think it is important mm. for our nation to heal and to move forward. <laughs> No so in those seats where he put his foot down, they got smashed. ...in an orderly timetable hurt our election prospects. The constitutional stipulation for pre-selections was not followed. It was undermined repeatedly, and that caused us not to have candidates in the field, and therefore it hurt our election prospects. 
Alex Hawke was returned as the member for Mitchell, but with a large swing against him. He, he's still there. He's still Shortly got his job. afterwards, <laughs> new hard right Liberal leader Peter Dutton dumped him from the front bench. That's right. Alex Hawke is not in the cabinet I at all. The They've completely now gotten rid of him. needs to be guided by people who are going to respect the constitution, to respect the views and not abuse them. I think that uh, Hawke should now look at his future, consider uh, the situation in relation to his um, next pre-selection and reflect on his actions and reflect on why his constituents uh, and party people in his area should continue to support him into the future. And that will ultimately be a decision for the selectors of Mitchell. Is a nasty, sniping, sort of childish, juvenile, valueless, principleless sort of culture that had built around, around Alex and, and, and his cohort. I think the guy's a cancer. I, I think Alex and the movement that he's built is a cancer that has infected the party and has grown into some of the better ends of the party as well. And it needs to be excised. This cancer needs to be cut out. Yeah. <laughs> Susan Lee survived a challenge from Christian Ellis in her seat of Farrah, thanks to Scott Morrison's intervention. None of what happened go. in New South Wales regarding these factional games impressed the public one little bit. Many mentioned it to me as I stood there on my own pre-poll and I think they were as bewildered as I was. You're in the Hawke Moderate faction New though. New South Wales Senator Andrew Bragg is proposing party rule changes to prevent the pre-selection chaos happening again. We want to make sure that we have candidates in the field. So we want to make sure that there is a timetable which is guaranteed for pre-selections, and that will also help us attract new people who want to be one of our candidates. And then we want to make sure that the division can get on and do the job without there being uh, undue interference from the leader's representative. Senator Bragg's broad suggestions are well and truly worth considering. In fact, everything needs to be on the table at this point in time as we work hard to get our house in order to resolve the issues that have caused the problems that have been unfortunately so apparent to the Australian people. <laughs> and Last month, makes Gladys look of innocent. Andy Wells left Parliament after 17 years. I'm very proud of my work as a senator. I don't resile from having stood up for the values and beliefs that I hold because I know that those values and beliefs are shared by millions of Australians. Yes, there have been difficult moments, but in the end, I believe that I've come out with my integrity intact. Do you accept any responsibility for contributing to the election result? Well, Sean, if proper procedures had been followed and we had adhered to the letter of the Constitution, a lot of the skullduggery that happened would not have happened. So if rules had been properly followed, then it would have been a very different path. We would not have had the captain's picks and the consequential disruptions that that brought. The Liberal Party is still grappling with the lessons of the election loss Thanks for your time. as the factional warfare continues. The once dominant party is weakened and remains deeply divided. I think there's an old saying that the rumours of my death are greatly exaggerated. I mean, every party goes through one of these processes after they lose government. I'm not particularly concerned about the long-term viability of the Liberal Party, but we must learn the lessons. We need to be closer to the grassroots. We need to address the issues on fairness. The general public is completely turned off by what they see as factional games. That's why we have to get our house in order. Our job is to fight for them, not fight each other. Well then cut the games out, Susan. <laughs> there you go, guys. There you go. And that is it. Wow, that was um, that was a lot. To the 200 of you listening live right now, give this a share. Get it out there. If 200 of you share it, this will reach 5,000 to 6,000 people on Facebook. Um, 
we're about to have a call with uh, John Ruddick. Now, John featured on there. Uh, John's an absolute legend. He is actually someone that ran for the Liberal Democrats, also known as the Libertarian Party in New South Wales. He was the lead Senate candidate. He did very well. Um, and I'm really excited to, to, to get him on the show. So I'm just going to give him a call right now so that we can all have a chat with him. Um, it's really interesting to see. Hey, John. John, how are you doing? Good, mate. I'll turn you down. Okay, yeah, I'm ready. Beautiful. You're, you're live right now with the audience, uh, John. Um, wow, what an amazing documentary expose. Be honest with us. How much of what you told the ABC was actually included in the actual ABC segment? Uh, uh, well, good question. Look, they would have been in my living room for about two hours, mm. and I suspect, uh, I think I had about half a minute on there. <laughs> um, so the truth is I had sort of shut my mouth off about uh, ScoMo and Alex Hall, and I was a little bit relieved to see that some of my more inflammatory uh, statements didn't make it to air. Mm. Mm. It certainly seemed as though they were piggybacking off some of those statements, especially for the promo. Um, what 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 was it about that text um, interchange that sort of made you hesitate on perhaps commenting on it? Okay, so I was told that this was going to be a four corners expose on the lack of democracy in the New South Wales Liberal Party. Now, I have, as you well know, Joel, I have left the Liberal Party. I was there for 25 years. I did write a book, Make the Liberal Party Great Again, on how they should... Mm. Eh? Great okay, book. Now yeah, then, great book. Thank you. Now, then COVID comes along, and you know, the Liberal Party gives us the COVID police state and the, the trillion-dollar debt and, you know... Uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the vaccine, you know, enforcing the vaccines on us and everything else. And so they, uh, you know, so I said, well, look, you know, uh, I can't wait around to try and wait to democratise the Liberal Party. I want to live. So I told Paul Connors, I said, look, I'm not exactly sure why you want me on because I'm not trying to help the Liberal Party anymore. Mm. And they said, no, 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 no. We want you on because, you know, you, you help play a role in the democracy thing. I said, okay. So I went along and all the questions were all about democracy, what Alex Hawke and ScoMo did to prevent democracy, democratic reforms, the plebiscite, and then out of the blue, they showed me this text message, which they did play on the Four Corners thing there. And the text message was this allegation, you know, look, from what we know, an unfounded allegation, saying that uh, somebody had asked a rich, uh, a, 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 some, his name's Fritz Mare, had asked him for fifty thousand dollars to help organise a branch tax or something. Now, mm. uh, so this was like an attack on my mates in the Liberal Party, and one of those people that was named in that text message is actually a client of my business. So right. I just said to four, right. I said to four corners, I said, "Look, I can't comment on this mm. because you know this guy is a client of mine." Right, and they right. knew I was a mortgage broker. Yeah, and so they just they just then they they just then said, oh, "Okay, no problem. Well, let's just move on to the next thing." They really milked like, that. So, they really milked that, yeah. didn't they? <laughs> yeah. Not a big deal. They put it out. They rang me up last Friday morning at seven thirty, and they said, "Look, John, we've put this promo together. We've got your thing on there about how we're, you know, you said you didn't want to comment because it's good marketing, mm. okay? But as you know, it's not a big deal, and we don't put it to air that he's a client of yours." And I said, "Okay, no problem." So it sounded like a big deal, but it wasn't a big deal. Right. All right. And that's that's so, why that's why I had to ask. I was like, okay, we all know what the mainstream media do. So I had to ask you that question. Um, John, you know, you you've as you we we've done an interview in the past, uh, just before the twenty twenty presidential US election. Uh, it was scarily accurate in predicting what was gonna happen. And we did talk briefly about uh, your book, Make the Liberal Party Great Again. Excellent book. Um, you are seeing a very interesting situation where there's this massive civil war happening in all the conservative parties in the Anglosphere. We're seeing it in Canada. We're seeing it in America with the rhinos versus the, the Trumpers. And we're also seeing it in the UK as we speak with over 57 uh, ministers resigning from the, the Morrison, sorry, sorry, from the uh, Boris Johnson uh, government. In Australia, yeah. this, this civil war is raging on as well. Where do you see people like Matthew Kamenzulli that are true conservatives? Where do you see them going from here? Well, Matthew Kamenzulli is a hero. Now, this is a situation about what's happening 
in the Eurico to the Anglosphere. It is the Anglosphere. It's also, interestingly, the same situation is happening with this extreme woke agenda, extreme global warming, extreme vaccine agenda. It's happening in the Anglosphere and the countries of Northern Europe, except for Sweden, good old Sweden. Uh, it's the former Protestant majority countries. Right. That's what that's what it is. The right. Anglosphere are, are still, you know, uh, yeah. Well, we just find we just found out last week Christianity is no longer a majority uh, faith in this country, which is, you know, pretty concerning. Mm. Uh, but what the people that have lost their faith in the last fifty years are the Protestants, and so they think they've lost their faith. They think they don't believe in any god, uh, but in fact they've found new gods, new false gods like global warming mm. and. Co- COVID extremism. Now, what's happening with the right-wing parties all around the world is this. You've got two types of people that join a, 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 a right of centre party. You've got true believers, like the listeners and the members of Turning Point Australia, mm. people who believe in good, sound principles that have worked for several hundred years about small government, etc., etc. And then you have careerists who join the Liberal Party because they want to be famous and they can't get a job in the real world, they've just decided this is their job, this is their career. Mm. Politics is, you know, they're not going to be an accountant or a solicitor or a butcher or a hairdresser. They're going, that's their career is going to be politics. So don't, it's, it's, and our career is about serving yourself, okay? Politics is meant to be about fixing up the country for the next generation. Mm. But what we have here, what we have here with the, we've got the left-wing media, uh, or the, the media is so left-wing at the moment, Mm. That the and they just shove it down everybody's throat. All this crap. Now then, what happens is the careerists in the right of centre party go along with the mainstream media crap, mm. like Matt Keane. They just sell things. They just sell us all out all the time because they're not interested in principles. They're interested in well, what's going to get me elected? So they think, well, we're a right of centre party. Let's pretend we're really left wing. Mm. You saw what happened to the Liberal Party in Western Australia and in South Australia. I think Dominic Perrottet and his $25 million uh, Aboriginal flag over the Harbour Bridge, I think he's heading down the same direction. Mm. Scott Morrison and Boris Johnson speak for themselves. Uh, so, so what we have is we have the true believers uh, are under attack, but we've got the truth. Okay, All we want to do is have smaller government uh, less taxes, deregulation, let the private sector flourish, and, you know, uh, a decent dose of traditional values compared to, you know, all these trannies in, with the, at the childcare centres these days, which mm. you know, just blows my mind. Mm. And I'm thinking, okay, we just need to get back to these simple values and then everyone's going to be happy. And that's, why pe- that's when people are successful. Now, the left's running the world right now and the world's really unhappy. Yeah. Now you have, I saw a poll the other day saying about 35% of Americans are proud to be an American. There you go. So, Joel, sorry for this rant, but I'll just say one last little thing. I believe it's going to turn around because these things do go in cycles. The left was all supreme in the 1960s, mm. and then they went, all that nothingness went out, went, got, it, got through the system. The right wing, you know, in the 80s and the 90s, uh, you know, Reagan, Thatcher, and everybody else. Uh, you know, we turn things around. And I believe we are going to turn around. And I believe, I hope, that the turnaround starts on the first week of November this year when we have the American midterm election. Mm. And I believe that we're going to have, you know, not just Republican majorities in both houses, but big Republican majorities and Trump-like Republican majorities. Um, I, yeah, I'm really looking forward to seeing what's happening in America as, as well. Um, we've had a few comments come in. Uh, Annie Long just said, uh, Joel and John, please tell us how to fix it. John, where do you go to, from here? Where do you see yourself going from here? Um, you ran with the Liberal Democrats. Um, I, I think the, you, that the Freedom Parties came marginally close to winning seat in the, in the seat of uh, in New South Wales. And um, it was a shame that the third senator uh, from the Liberal National Party uh, wasn't uh, Conchetta for Avanti Wells, who we saw in that. Where do we go from here? Where do you see yourself going? Okay, so in Australia, we've got the Victorian election not far away in November, mm. and we've got that uh, Dan Andrews up for re-election, and the Liberal Democrats will be contesting that election, and then we've got the New South Wales election next March. Now, 
there's three significant freedom parties or, you know, non-liberal national parties of the right in this country. There's the Liberal Democrats, there's One Nation, and there's uh, United Australia. And we all like each other. And on most of the big issues, we agree with each other. Now, we do have some differences, important differences, but I think what we do is the three parties should do their absolute best at the coming state elections and preference each other. And then we see what the lay of the land is after the New South Wales election next year. Now, I hope that the Liberal Democrats have a big breakthrough and that the other parties, which we like them, we particularly like their members, uh, you know, are based around personalities. Mm. By Palmer and Paul and Hanson, who I have a lot of high regard for the two of them. Mm. But a party based around a personality can't endure forever. Now, the Liberal Democrats doesn't have a big dominant personality, but we do have the best policies and we have the best principles. So I'm hoping that the Liberal Democrats become the dominant sort of minor party on the right after the New South Wales election. Now, if that does not happen, I believe that we need to have a think in about 12 months' time about having a situation where there is a greater level of formal cooperation between these parties. Because if you add up the three votes of those three parties and a couple of other very good parties, like I'm up, who I like a lot, mm. uh, we add up all those votes, we've got a senator. Yeah. We've got a senator. We've got six senators in six states. So That's right. Two, we've mm. got 12. If we were one-tenth. Now, um, we don't need to rush into this. It may not, you know, maybe one of these three parties is going to sort of pull ahead and become the dominant party, uh, you know, but we'll see how that goes in 12 months' time. Absolutely. I, I've made the point um, in just in comment sections, but this will be the first time I say it on video. You know, I, I spent a lot of time uh, as a commentator, not being a part of any specific party, but supporting the 10 freedom parties. And um, I think that going forward, there are some parties that are out there that we, we had some of the most unusual black swan events happen over the course of the last two years. If you can't win an election with those events happening, then when can you win an election? So I, I'm, I'm of the avid belief that there are a number of different routes that people should probably take. And I think that the four freedom parties that have parliamentarians, so that's um, Bob Catter, who's the only one that out of the freedom parties that won a lower house seat uh, in the federal election. I think that the UAP in, in Victoria, Absolutely, they should stick around. They they got a senator in. I think in Queensland, um, one nation having two senators is phenomenal. Um, also, the um, the Liberal Democrats in Victoria as well on a state level have parliamentarians as well elected. I think the other parties, if you're in the other parties, look, it, this is a democracy. If you want to keep having at it, no worries. But people like John, they've been around for a very long time. I've read their book. You know, there reaches a point where you've got to reassess what are you doing? I mean, absolutely, the freedom vote is 15 to 20% in each of the states when you add them together. And any senator that got elected in Queensland and in Victoria, they needed votes from some of the smaller 10 out of the 10 freedom parties to get elected. It was a team effort. But there is an element of uh, economies of scale, which happens when you consolidate into uh, multiple parties or less parties. I think we are fragmented. And um, I think that, John, if, if one thing I would love to see is for people, keep your party groups, but just bring them just like you would with factions into parties, because then you can start working together. But when the time comes and when you've had that primary process, which is something that you want to introduce as well, when you've had that process, then you actually all get behind the same candidate and you move forward and you fight an election on the same page. And if you didn't, if you weren't happy with your candidate, then you, in the next election, in the pre-selections, you fight harder to get your candidate up. So I would love for a lot of these freedom parties to have those debates about policy uh, in the party. What, what do you think? What do you think about that? Okay. Well, look, it does feel as though we are sort of sitting around even though we all like each other and we have supporters like you in the media who are friends with all of us, um, it does feel like we're sitting around in a circle cutting each other's throats, okay? Mm. Accidentally, because what, what is happening is we all preference each other on our how-to-vote card, but our vote, 
you know, very often they will vote one UAP or Lib Dem or IMOP or um, Pauline Hanson, and then they'll vote two Liberal. Very often. I mean, if, if, you, if you look on the AEC, you can dig down on this data. Mm. So your point is, Joel, and I think it's definitely one which should be seriously considered, I think if we add one plus one plus one, it won't equal three, it'll equal four or five. Mm. People will, you know, okay, there's one party. Okay, now, now this is that's the upside of it. Now, the downside is this. It is true that over the last two years, we've all been totally united on anti-COVID BS, mm. anti-the debt, and while we might have a little bit of disagreement about the vaccine, we all strongly agree that the vaccine should be voluntary and private. Mm. Okay, now, so that has brought us all together. However, 99% of legislation is about money and economics. Okay? Mm. Now, people like Bob Catter, who I like immensely, Okay, and other people, Pauline Hanson, who I like immensely, these people do not share, you know, well, they don't have the same commitments that, let's say, the Liberal Democrats do mm. to sound fiscal policy. And that is the gut of running a government at the end of the day. These other issues, like abortion and euthanasia and a war or a pandemic, these things that come along and they're always very important. They only come along rarely, but every day, you know, every day Parliament sits legislation is passing and it's about how we're going to spend the money. Now, the Liberal Democrats believe, well, you know, the less the government can spend, the better. So it means the citizens are going to have more money, then we can grow real wealth through the private sector. Now, this, this would be, this would now, when I hear Pauline Hanson's policies, she's generally pro business, okay? But she doesn't. She sort of seems to think that we can use the state, use the power of the state to sort of bring about the objectives that we want. Well, we think it's better to just have a smaller state, and then people will spontaneously uh, build a stronger country. But look, mm. I, if we did have some type of a merger, or you know, some type of a closer cooperation, mm. it could work along the lines where the other parties could concede to one nation that we do need a tougher immigration policy. Okay, mm. I'd be happy to go along with that. But in exchange, then the the other parties would have to sort of give the Liberal Democrats a little bit of a um, little bit more say on the economic now, matters. We wouldn't want to dominate, but we would say, look, we do think this is our specialty. We do have some very, very smart economists in our party who know their stuff, mm. and we would sort of like to have the lion's share the say on that. But anyway, it's all theoretical for now, but mm. we'll see what happens in the state election. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's a school of thought which uh, I think that Matthew Kamenzuli probably subscribes to. Uh, he still wants to get back into the Liberal Party, where he single-handedly held up the election for one or two months and because he was trying to democratise the party. And on one occasion, I think he the entire state executive of the Liberal Party actually owed their existence to him because he... He provided some legal advice, which said which they shouldn't be dissolved before the election. I, I think that there are there is still a big movement in the Liberal Party um, that's actually trying to make the point that hang on, we can reform it from the inside. And this is the thing: I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly whether you know um, whether people should be sticking with the Freedom Parties or trying to flood the Liberal Party and take over it. In America, it's a little bit more of a clear cut response, though, and maybe the UK as well. In America, you've got the Trump revolution, everyone fighting the Republican Party, fighting for free and fair pre-selection so that they get their guy up. And we've been seeing some amazing results. And as you said before, I can't wait to see what happens in November. My concern is that the major parties, because of the legislation they've passed, including the one against the Liberal Democrats, they're further and further entrenching their power in the system. And it's getting really crazy seeing how unmovable they are getting so we I, i'm worried we're going to get to that tipping point where it's like we're getting to the point guys where we might actually have to flood the major parties you know i, I always use the greens party as an example if everyone in the freedom movement flooded the greens party man we could get some nuclear energy passed um you know it, I, I just think i just think that you know uh there is we're in the discussion period in the post-mortem period right now and um yeah 
these are the discussions we need to be having. Yeah, well, we do. It's important if we if we love our country and we want our, 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 you know, the next century to be successful for Australia, politics is important. Now, one option that you've raised is all the Freedom Parties join the Liberal Party and try to fix it up. Now, uh, I just think that we do need a fresh start because the Liberal Party has made three massive errors in the last two years. Uh, the global warming hysteria, you know, ScoMo selling out on net zero carbon, whatever, uh, COVID police state, and and the debt. Now, and then forcing the vaccines on us. Now, I just think that, you know, well, one option is we say, well, we'll forget about that Liberal Party and hopefully we'll be better in the future. No, I just think, look, Obviously, political parties can make mistakes and can be forgiven, of course, of course, all the time. Uh, but I just think on those three issues, it's unforgivable betrayal. Mm. And therefore, we do need, and I think there is enough energy on the right for a new force to emerge that can be at least as big as the Greens, but on the right, and hopefully become the party of government. I do believe that we do need to put the energy into a new force, which I very much hope is the Liberal Democrats. Mm. Now, the one thing that would make me think that would be open to what you're saying is in the very unlikely event that the Liberal Party did embrace full democracy. Now, I know that Matthew Cameron's always been fighting a heroic fight out there for democratic selection of candidates, Mm. but the biggie the really big thing that's going to truly change Australian politics is if the parliamentary leader is elected by the party membership. Mm -hmm. So if the position of the Prime Minister and the Premier or the opposition leaders is elected by the membership, and that is the gut of my book, Make the Liberal Party Great Again. This is what they do in Canada. This is what they do in Great Britain, which is what we're meant to have based our parliament on. Now, it's going to happen at some point, uh, but if they did that, if you had, say, 200,000 members of the Liberal Party across this country and there's a national convention and we vote for who we want to be the parliamentary leader, we'd never have a jerk like Malcolm Turnbull or Scott Morrison win because mm. they don't believe in anything. That's right. Okay, you have a true believer that would get up and win. Mm. And, and that's what could really turn things around and it would help the right wing of the Liberal Party but as usual, the right wing of the Liberal Party gets it wrong, mm. okay? It's tactics. And so they can't see. I mean, when I first introduced the idea of having democratic precincts in the Liberal Party in 2011, the biggest opponents were the stupid people who ran the right wing faction. They said, no, 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 no. Now, the, right, the, the, the supporters of the right wing faction. Right. No way. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah, that's what happened. That's what happened. I could bore you for two hours to tell you about that. <laughs> Another time. But, <laughs> yeah. but the right-wing troops, the supporters of the right-wing said, no, no, this is great. Let's mm. have democracy. But the right-wing leadership couldn't see it. Yeah. And they to, still to this day, they cannot see mm. that if the members get to vote for the parliamentary leader, the right-wing will, take, will, will run the Liberal Party and they will make Australia a happier and a stronger country. Mm. Mm. I, I think that one of the most encouraging things that we've seen is um, in the span of such a short time, uh, two years, we've had such a huge interaction from the general public, the silent Australians, with their democracy. Um, in summary, the, the freedom community, it's you know 15% of the vote in every state. That's a Senate spot. We've demonstrated the ability to build a whole new media class and a whole bunch of new uh, political parties uh, if we choose to. We've raised hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars, for lawsuits where people have needed it. And um, we've also demonstrated an ability to muster hundreds of thousands of people around. From If we picked Canberra, we muster 400,000 people in Canberra. I think that we are truly the strongest 15 to 20 percent in many ways but there are institutional challenges which we're facing just today we heard george christensen get uh, kicked off paypal uh, which is something which uh, we're going to have to work to find a way around but um look 
John, I could talk to you for hours as we did before the US election and maybe we will have another chat uh, concerning the US election and where you see things going. You're a wealth of knowledge. Um, I, I want to thank you so much for making the time on here. Do you have anything uh, left to leave the 200 people listening live uh, right now? A final message? Yep. Okay, well, it's this. Uh, despite having very, very, very underwhelming and disappointing politics in this country, the truth is Australia is still a magnificent country, okay, and we are the only country in the history of the planet that's had a whole continent to ourselves. Mm. And so because of that, and a relatively small population, it's a growing population, now this means, because we've got a whole continent, all the wealth, all the mineral wealth and all the wealth in the oceans and the farming and everything else, and then all of our people, uh, because of we've got all this uh, wealth, we can, act, we can still be a very successful country uh, with mediocre leadership. But what I, and this is what we basically have had for a very long time, okay, we're still great. We're still a great country. But my point is, imagine how great Australia could be with really terrific, gutsy leadership, mm. okay? Really, really brings about good government in this country. Australia could be this extraordinary powerhouse for goodness on the whole planet. We could be really showing the, the world the way you know, we could really, I mean, you look at the little Singapore and little Hong Kong, mm. they were like libertarian paradises. Poor old not Hong Kong got snuffed out, but, you know, yeah. very low tax, very low regulation, pro-business, government gets out of your way. Mm. And they're two very little blocks of uh, uh, territory. Little, but they, they just had enormous wealth that, that lifted up, helped lift up the rest of Asia. Now, imagine what if we had those same principles in this country, very pro-business, uh, and low taxes and everything, Australia could be an absolute powerhouse and a really stabilising force in this corner of the world. Mm, absolutely. Um, there, a once great man said uh, about Australia that uh, we have everything we need. We have the minerals, we have, you know, absolute God been blessed with resources, except we have one thing we're missing, and that's, as you said, leadership. And so, um, yeah, we're, we're, lo we're looking to people to see them be leaders, not just for the whole country, but leaders in their industry, leaders to stand up. People like John Larder that stood up and said, no, I'm not going to take the jab. I'm, I'm a surgeon. People like Graham Hood and, you know, an, an air pilot for Qantas. I mean, he, he inspired so many American pilots to stand up and almost single-handedly halted what was going on over there with the mandates. Um, I think you're absolutely right, John, and um, I'm looking forward to having more of these chats uh, in situ, but uh, I want to thank you for your time. Um, John, what, what's, what, what are you planning for the future? Well, look, we're going to have a Democratic pre-selection for the Liberal Democrat uh, candidate for the New South Wales Upper House, mm. which we're looking forward to. Awesome. Uh, so that's really the, the major focus. I'm working on a, uh, a podcast about... Um, uh, a few little episodes about Australian political history, which should be quite interesting. Mm. Uh, so that's it. But look, Joel, I do want to say I've been following what you guys have been doing at Turning Point Australia, and I have been a big fan of Turning Point America uh, for a while. And uh, so, you know, thank you for what you're doing, mate, because you're really uh, getting the grassroots, you know, you're educating them, you're getting them fired up, you're organising them. And, mate, we, you know, it, when when the... When liberty comes to this country, it's going to be because of heroes like yourself, Joel. Uh, look, uh, thank you so much for saying that, John. I, I'm just a pale reflection of the people that have helped educate me, like yourself, like yourself writing excellent books, uh, like Dr. Stephen Shavura and uh, Professor David Flint and Augusto Zimmerman. I'm just a reflection of the people that are educating me, and I'm trying to share that uh, with the world. We've still got a long way to go with Turning Point Australia. We've been around for, I think, 10 months compared to nine years with the American Turning Point. But um, we've right. got plenty of plans to do some more collaboration with them. We've got national tours plans. Uh, we're just getting started. But uh, thank you again so much for making time for us, John. Uh, I'll see you later. Okay, good on you, John. Great to speak, mate. Look forward to speaking again. Ciao. Okay, mate. Well, there you have it, guys. Um, that was really fascinating, um, having a chat with John. Um, I hope you guys really enjoyed it. Um, if you want to support uh, exactly these sort of conversations, I'm going to be doing plenty more of these now that I'm back, now that I've you know got, this, got the setup properly done and also I've had a bit of a break. Um, if you really want to support my work, 
uh, go and donate here at uh, www.tpost.com.au forward slash donate. It's with, it uses PayPal uh, facilities. I don't like that. I don't like that at all. But for now, I've got to keep and keep on doing that. Um, if you want to donate privately to me um, to support my work and keep the bills at bay, uh, hit me up on Instagram. I'll send you my private bank details so we can go around uh, PayPal because I'm not a big fan of uh, using their facilities, especially after them getting rid of um, George Christensen. I've got an interview coming up with George Christensen where he's going to talk about these guys and what they've what they've done to him and shutting him out. I'm not happy with it. This is the story of what happens with conservatives. You get smashed off a lot of these platforms, whether it's social media, whether it's payment providers, um, even server providers, and we're sick of it. We're building our own, and I've already been contacting a number of people to talk about viable alternatives that we're not going to be kick, get kicked off. It'll take time to, to make. We can't just do it like that, but um, I really want to thank you guys for tuning in. There's over 100 of you listening live right now, almost 200. Give this a share. Get it out there. If 200 people give this a share, it'll reach to tens of thousands of people across all of the platforms. Thank you so much. I hope you guys have a great day. And uh, be sure to, to donate if you can support uh, this work and these, these podcasts. Tomorrow uh, at about 4 or 5 o'clock, I will be sitting down here and I'll be doing another live stream. We'll be watching uh, exactly what's going on with the nuclear discussion. And we'll be having a, we'll be doing a similar watch show where we'll be looking at uh, Chris Kenny and his uh, documentary on nuclear energy. It goes for about an hour. I know you guys will enjoy it. Thank you for tuning in. Give it a share. Give it a like. Leave a comment. Let me know what you thought. And um, I'll be sure to make sure I keep uh, including uh, this content in future stuff. I'll see you guys later.